Yes, Dr. Dr. Song, thank you so much for that. Um, another important mention of display. Hand up in the middle, Sergio. It would be helpful um, to have, I mean, if everyone's broadly happy with these guidelines, that's, that's fine. But any, we have received some written comments about the guidelines, thank you. We've had some comments on LinkedIn and Facebook pages, but this is your opportunity for verbal comments. Um, I actually have a comment about the guidelines themselves. I think it would be very useful to separate them into different sections regarding management, risk, and then also um, um, study and finally loans, because some of the guidelines really yeah. apply to museums which are not um, going to move with objects like wooden object, wooden structures, which are going to be in environmental conditions which need to be um, studied, but not necessarily controlled. And I think also it would be useful to have something on airflow, simply because that is such a key yeah. issue for um, yeah. preventing mold, for preventing um, damage. And uh, we've heard a lot in this conference about the importance of airflow, airflow and air exchange. And that is something which maybe needs to be addressed a little bit further. That's great. Thank, thank you, Austin. That's very helpful. Um, I'm going to go there and then to the second row. So this gentleman on the end.呃刚才讨论了很多温湿度的一个标准的问题啊我有一个观点就是可能前面在台上的各位嘉宾都没有提到就是我觉得避免这个温度和湿度的波动是非常重要的应该给他限定一个波动的一个范围这是我觉得就
interesting results. But it should also be said that when we talk about installing equipment that controls relative humidity and temperature for the sake of saving energy costs and carbon footprint, I think it's pretty well established now that for most places internationally, the costs of lighting are far greater than the cost of humidity and temperature control. Both can be wasteful, I don't mean they're not, but that lighting uh, from the standpoint of carbon footprint is, is something that definitely needs to be addressed more directly. And we're much further ahead with industry developing LEDs and energy efficient systems. Thank you. Um, can we go back to the um, Barbara in the front, in the middle of the second row, please? And then be ready to put your hands up after this, this one. Thank you. I think that if we separate out the fear that conservators have about being wrong from this whole issue, we might move forward because conservators don't want to lose face, seriously. They don't want to be seen to be wrong, but I think it is possible to look at this issue from a think locally, act globally perspective. I totally agree with Linda Stefano and Jirong Song that structures and objects which have existed comfortably, beautifully, for hundreds of years should not be messed with. And okay, it doesn't have big scientific technological interventions, but that's because those interventions are not needed. And as pointed out, they are damaging. I personally believe that what we can do is say, things where they are, if they are stable, that's great. Let's focus research on how to transition objects for loan if something is going from hot, humid Hong Kong for one-year display in cold, dry Ottawa, then the research should tell us what kind of acclimatization does this object need to then survive in Canada. Thank you. And I, did you mean um, think globally, act locally? <laughs> just, just, just checking. I thought you were being really ambitious, acting globally. <laughs> yes, Jerry. Can I just make a quick comment about that? Because you're absolutely right, and I think m most will, will agree with that. However, there's also a new challenge that we face. They're now growing grapes in Cornwall. You know, our, our, our planet, on the champagne our planet's almost. environment is changing. And so those structures that have comfortably existed may no longer comfortably exist. Those, those collections that didn't need environmental control quite may in the future. How, how do we guide that is a big issue for us. Um, thanks, Jerry. I can see we've got, we've got a hand up there. Did we just there, Pam? Pam Hatchfield, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, I'm also going to put on my hat my uh, hat as president of American Institute for Conservation, and I want to commend this wonderful um, effort that you made in Melbourne, and I'm sorry I wasn't there. Um, I just want to say that there is an environmental working group of AIC which has been revved up and recently um, has been doing a lot of work um, also at our last meeting in May in uh, San Francisco, uh, the program was focused around um, uh, preventive conservation and collections care with a tremendous focus on the environment. And uh, there's a lot of good information there for people who uh, would like to access it either through the AIC website, through the blog, or through the environment, the wiki, uh, and environmental uh, aspect of that. Um, I also wanted to mention the, uh, oh, I also wanted to say that this working group um, would be incredibly interested in 
uh, joining forces with you all um, and putting together some sort of a statement that could really be a global statement. So I hope that we can get together and figure out a way to do that um, in short order, because I think we're all coming to the very same point in our deliberations, confusion, and discussion. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, we did, and when I say we, that was uh, me and Sarah Nunberg, the sustainability group of AIC and Northeastern University last year did a very interesting, at least I thought they were interesting, life cycle assessment, a series of life cycle assessments of the uh, loan process, which I think was the least accurate of all three. Um, a uh, particular example of lighting in our, a lighting problem we had in our museum and also uh, a temporary shutdown of climate to see in a particular set of galleries what the effects were on our environment, our control of the environment. I think that this is a very useful tool for everybody to consider. Um, we presented a poster of this at the AIC meeting and also there was a meeting in Paris last year at which this work was presented. We will publish it, but if you go online and look for life cycle assessment, it's a very interesting and useful tool that you can use to evaluate particular problems that you have in your individual collection or institution. I also wanted to finally mention the um, Getty Project, or the Getty Conservation Institute Managing the Museum Environment Project, which is a very interesting project and they are going to be collecting a lot of existing data, experiential um, uh, data that people have observed uh, and trying to understand the implications of that those uh, results based on what they have observed in their collections as changes as either the, um, the uh, uh, the um, environmental uh, controls have been shut down, power outages and this sort of thing, or uh, instability in the climate in the building. So anyway, just a bunch of Thanks. excited thoughts. Thank you yeah. for this wonderful thank discussion. Th thank you, Pam. Um, I've got a question over there at the back. Yeah, I'll just take that one first. Where's the one up there? We'll do, we'll do the one up the front next. Uh, we can set standards in environmental control. For instance, like when I was in China, uh, to help a museum to do um, a loan exhibition to another museum. And the museum in UK, of course, will ask for ICOM's uh, standard report. However, we also experience this kind of problem, which I believe is not uh, very uncommon in China, that is, when the collection arrived at the museum, we found that there is no professional art handler. We mm -hmm. have to train security guy in the uh, National yeah, yeah. Art Museum to hang the, the painting. Uh, are we going to set a standard and research on uh, temporary chain staff in the museum? Th thank you. Jerry, I wonder if that's one for you because you felt that this discussion should be broadened or dr song which of dr song looks like she'd like to <laughs> thank you sarah <laughs> dr song I'm, you may I'm, like to come I'm, next i meant they're growing olives in cornwall now <laughs> um, it it's not so much that i think this particular uh discussion should be broadened at this moment beyond temperature and relative humidity i think but it, but it can act as a model for all those other issues that we have that we thought in those days of prescriptive idealism, we thought were being handled well, but we now realize aren't handled well. So there's, there's a lot to do, but I think we need to get through this issue of temperature and humidity and then use it as a model for all the other issues. What I think Sarah is referring to is that I think there's a big group internationally that we should be more um, we should be more welcoming to and should be included more in these discussions, and that's registrars and uh, collections managers. In some of the discussions, they have been present, uh, but not in enough. And I think across our world, very often they're the ones who make these recommendations or decisions. And certainly, in the case of loans, they're often the gateway to what is being required. Um, 
you know, that, that issue of loans, I think, um, is, is a really contentious one because there are some who believe part of this discussion is motivated by making loans easier. That may, in fact, be the outcome, but I don't think it's, it's sort of that uh, deceitful about it. There's a real problem in our profession in that some conservators who are setting standards for a loan are trying to look more professional by being more restrictive. So you, uh, sorry, it's true, right? Um, so <laughs> what you've got is a collection that has no environmental control. The object is perfectly happy, but when it's sent out for loan, it's plus minus 1%, and you can't measure that. So we have to get over our own issues internally first, I think, and this is helping. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Anyone else on the panel want to come back on that question? If not, I think we must have... I, I'm really conscious of time. Um, one, one question from here. Oh, was, who was first here? Oh, there. I'm going to take two more, and then I am, going, I'm afraid, going to have to... So you, 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 and you, and I hope there wasn't anyone at the back I've missed. Oh, Edward, yes. Uh, Edwards. Hello, hello. Edward C. from the Hong Kong Government Record Service. Uh, I think I have two comments on the issue. The first is about uh, the concept of natural frequency. Uh, uh, Jerry has described uh, the, the frequency of change, the fluctuation, uh, may not be detrimental, whether it's high or slow. I mean, the fast or slow. It's all about the, the natural frequency of the material. If the fluctuation matches it, that would be quite detrimental. But since we don't know the natural frequency, I mean the response of the hygroscopic material to the change of RH and the temperature, we don't know the actual response. And that should have some research in this direction. For every kind of material we have, we should have this kind of data. And in long run, how about merging these uh, data together for uh, composite material, uh, which we at the moment we don't know. Uh, but in the storage, we have most of the items are composite materials. And the second comment is about uh, the change in the environment. Uh, I was asked many times, uh, how about if the collection item that have been uh, uh, stored in, in a certain set of temperature and, and uh, RH, and it is unknown to other places, but with a totally different set of uh, temperature and, and relativity. But for how long can it be uh, sent out and then returned? I was asked several times about this question, and we solved, the, uh, I mean preliminary, solved the question uh, with the concept of rate of deterioration. Uh, you know there is a, a tool in the conservation world. It's called the preservation index, which is which was invented by IPI. Uh, I would like to know more. I mean, in the future, if research is allowed, whether for every kind of material we have, we can measure actually the rate of deterioration, so that we can determine for how long can it be put in certain set of environment. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those comments. And a final comment from the lady in the fourth row. Hi. Um, I must say I'm a registrar, so I just wanted to kind of get back to um, Jerry's comment, because I'm a conservator by kind of training, so I have like both things, both hats in my head. Just wanted to actually um, tell you that it's actually true that registrars are already discussing about all these issues on a different level. There's actually a big movement in Europe called collections mobility, which has been worrying about getting loans easier, in a way. And they do have all these things in their head. I mean, they, they actually think about it. And I really think we should kind of have a hand, hold in hands together and work, work towards a solution together so we all understand what we're getting. On the other side, I also think that part of this collection mobility thing um, gives us to a different uh, way of thinking, which is um, that each of us in our respective uh, professions, we tend to get really narrow-minded sometimes of what we're doing. So I just wanted to point out as a kind of final comment maybe that 
It is really important that we're preserving all these objects and that's what conservators have to do and it's their focus and I understand it. But I also think that there's actually other way to see why we're doing this preservation. What's the reason behind it? One of it is, yes, we're preserving it for future generations. You also said that. But what about the current generations? What about sharing cultural heritage? How, what about learning to work together by just sharing a heritage? So we, we, don't, we don't have to lose that focus in a way. That, that's part of what we're all doing together. And it's not, you know, we can't just prevent objects from moving just to preserve them for whom and for what. Yeah. Let's move them and let's, you know, let's work together to, yeah. to make that happen. Thank, th thank, you, thank you for that great, offer. Great discussion, actually. Thank you. Um, I, I, we're going to have to wrap up very soon. I just wondered if any members of the panel who haven't had a chance to speak during the, the discussion would like to, to say anything. Um, Lynn? Just one, one thing to think about. Um, one of the panelists uh, referred specifically uh, to involving museum professionals across the board in making important decisions. And I started to think about, there also are the communities. And I don't know how we address what the community thinks and what the community's priorities are about protection. So. Yeah. This is money, human resources. Yes, thank you. Vinod? I just want to make um, a couple of very quick comments. Um, I think as this discussion progresses, it'll be great if, uh, if everyone keeps in mind the broader paradigm on what we are working with. Probably 99% of the museums globally are not climate controlled. Mm. In spite of having that many museums, the museums are probably custodians of hardly 10% of the heritage. All the rest are in private hands. In terms of the broader training paradigm, whatever we might say, I mean, I work quite a lot in countries like India. I would imagine 90 plus percent of the museum staff are not trained. We can't change it in a hurry. So that's the kind of paradigm that we are working in. And what we as a profession need to do is take some risk and show leadership. And if you don't do that, if you're trying to probably find answers for every bit, we won't get there. So as we progress on this over the next few years, I think we've got to take some risk, so show some leadership, and that's the only way we'll probably progress. Thank you. Um, Richard or Yun Chang Yang? Uh, just to, to make the observation that I think it's very important for conservators to engage in the building chain right from the architects down to the actual people that are installing their showcases because the decisions that are made very early on in a building project have profound um, impacts on the, in the environment and they're very, very hard to change. So in, in investing in, in planning and talking with... Um, technical suppliers and planners is, is very important and um, a lot of museum buildings decisions made 20 years ago are still um, bothering us. I'm sure you can appreciate that point. Thank you. Thank you. Yung Chang Yang, would you like to say anything else? Hey, actually, I was just going to say something about the question. I think the most important thing to do as a protection of the building is to do the most important thing to do in the building process. 你可能对文物的了解可能更重要一方面你可能心里对文物的本身一定了解的很清楚包括它的材质另一方面我觉得另外一个做保护修复的人也有一个责任就是说你一定要对整个的新的技术所了解这样来说你可能能够对这个文物
Um, we, I mean, none of you have, have come back either in your written comments or in the discussion this morning to register um, very much anything other than agreement for these guidelines. Just by a show of hands, perhaps if you support taking forward these guidelines, um, we, will, we will incorporate the written comments um, and the verbal comments we have received, um, but I don't envisage those making any major changes. They will be small changes rather than significant changes to the document. So could I ask you to raise your hands if you um, support this document, please? And perhaps, thank you, there are a lot of hands in the air. I hope that the translation caught up with that. And <laughs> I, I obviously wasn't listening to the translation. Um, and it, it, just to give anyone, does anyone have a huge disagreement with these um, guidelines? Putting you on the spot now. One, two. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the majority were in favour of the guidelines, so thank you for that. And um, on Friday afternoon, we will hope to be able to announce the final version of the guidelines, which then can be disseminated through IIC and ICOMCC. Thank you for your participation in this session. And thank you to the panellists. Thank you very much, panellists, for, for taking part.